the power of love. One of my favorite things about this course, about teaching it, is that I get to share lots of my favorite stories. Here's one. Here's one. I was leading a group, a big group, about 70 people, in a special chanting session where we would all sit in a circle and a small group would sit in the middle and we would sing to them. And then afterwards they'd tell us how it felt. And it's often a very deeply emotional experience and, and very touching. And one young woman, uh, afterwards she was sitting there and she had tears in her eyes and she said, you know, when I was sitting here and everybody was singing and I was feeling these waves of love all around me, I realized something. I realized that I had been thinking all my life that in order to be happy, I have to be with somebody. But in this moment, I realized that I'm somebody. So that stayed with me. Another favorite thing or favorite story of mine is the Lord of the Rings. Now I know not everybody knows this story, so here's a little snippet from it. This is the great wizard Gandalf and the little hobbit, the, the, the kind of diminutive hero figure who shows great resilience and courage. And there's this kind of pitiable but somewhat really quite evil creature in the story, or per, sort of a person, who um, uh, he's murdered people. He's really a very dangerous person, actually, but he's also very pitiable. His name's Gollum. And the young character here, Frodo, he's asking when my uncle had a chance to kill this creature, Gollum. It's, and he didn't kill him. It's a pity that he didn't kill him when he had a chance, because he's so horrible, so terrible. He's done so many awful things. And the wizard, the wise wizard, said it was pity that stayed his hand. It means he felt compassion for this awful creature who was suffering. And actually, this, the fact that he, what unfolds later in the story, and it's, in my opinion, perhaps the key theme of this much debated story, uh, my theory is that it was because they spared this creature, Gollum, Gollum was the one in the end who destroyed the ring of power that belonged to the Lord of the Rings, the Dark Lord, and he saved the world. So out of compassion, out of love and pity, came the salvation of the whole world. So deeply symbolic, metaphorical, and very subtle. Not everybody notices this, at least on the first pass of this story. So that's me indulging this great story, but uh, it, it was written by, you know, Tolkien, who was a great philosopher, a very deeply spiritual man, and he wanted to make this point, I think, in a very subtle way, that actually the power of love is the greatest power. And that's my interpretation of Tolkien. As I said, <laughs> there are a hundred opinions on this one. But the <clears throat> this idea of love has great impact. This idea of, of, of kind of loving not just yourself, but not just your family, not just your friends, but the world and, and the world around us and all creatures, all living things. This is central to the great spiritual traditions. And uh, of you know obviously Christianity and Buddhism and Hinduism and, and uh, Tantra and yoga and and more. And uh, it's not that everybody practices it, but the, this is the idea. The idea is held uh, very high. And uh, there are different ways of looking at the world. Now materialism, the idea that you know matter matter or money or these things matter a lot is one worldview, and, it, and it, it's based on this idea that matter is, only matter matters, ultimately. Idealism is, a, is less common in the Western world, but it's, an, it's a very widespread worldview in, in, in Asia, particularly. The idea that actually the world is somehow isn't real, that it's kind of illusion, and therefore nothing matters, and we should just accept it and be um, not be disturbed by what happens, even if it's people suffering or whatever. Now, this, to me, is a very defective worldview. 
The worldview of Tantra, which is the philosophy underlying yoga, the sort of ancient, not, not ancient sort of spiritual philosophy of, of yoga, is that everything matters. And I, f I found online this t-shirt, someone thought of this before me, I'm glad to say, because it's not my idea. Everything matters, this is the worldview of Tantra. And to me, this is the worldview of seeing the world as though, yeah, everything is uh, uh, special, everything is magical. Everything is, is, is precious and everyone's life, even small creatures, plants, everything is important. There's a beautiful every year in Thailand, it's called Met, it's a kind of metta meditation. Metta, is, metta meditation goes like this. In this instance, they gather one million children. This is one of the pictures from that event. One million children in this vast temple and they all meditate together. And they practice this meta meditation where they um, deliberately try and project or radiate a feeling of love for all of the world and to bring peace to the world. And I thought about this and I thought, I wonder if this works. I mean, there's, there's not, I mean, the world is not exactly at peace. Here, here it is in the daytime, the same, all the children. Um, and I thought, wow, I wonder what kind of impact that has. Maybe there's some subtle impact on, you know, on the surrounding area. They radiate some kind of waves. I don't know. But what I do think is for sure is that this will have a lasting impact on the children for the rest of their lives. Can you imagine being part of that? So I love this idea of, you know, spreading love, deliberately doing this, going to so much effort to spread love to the world. Now, Somebody once asked my spiritual master in India, they asked him, how can we measure spiritual progress? And this person was thinking about power. Now this course is about powers. They were thinking, oh, maybe if I, I will, if I develop the power to read somebody's mind or to heal somebody, that's an indicator of spiritual progress. And the spiritual master said, no, these kind of powers have nothing to do with real spiritual progress. The only measure of spiritual progress is the periphery of your love. It means periphery means how wide is the circumference of the circle which embraces all of those living creatures and that power portion of the universe that you really feel love for. So it's a big demand. It's, it's a tall order, as they say, to love everybody. Uh, but that's the goal. To feel and to expand this feeling of love for all. And that's how he defined spiritual progress. And so how do we expand the periphery of our love? How, you know, not everybody's like inspires love, not everything or people around us, not every creature inspires love. In the face of that, how do we cultivate this feeling? There are many ways to do this actually, but one of the, uh, the, the, the most, the easiest, I would say, and most effective is spiritual music and chanting and singing, or what we call kirtan. And uh, that is something that we will be practicing in this course a lot. We'll be singing, using this the power of, of sound and music to, to awaken this emotion, this expansive limit, this kind of feeling of connection that enables us to open our hearts and feel love for everyone around us and even people we don't know and animals we can't see and everything. The other big thing that we can do to cultivate this feeling is to serve others and to feel, okay, my, I'm here, I want to have a happy life, that's fine, but really what brings me greatest happiness is to help others. And I have a, 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 a dear friend who researches this, he researches compassion. Uh, Dr. Jim Doty, he works at Stanford University and he, he has a whole project that he's founded uh, and they, re they research compassion and altruism. And what he's discovered at, in his life and what he's um, trying to, you know, he's validating through their research is that actually uh, compassion and empathy are a natural expression of a part of our nature as human beings. And it's good for us. It, it's, it, it, it fulfills us, it completes us, as they say, to, to express this through service, to, to act on compassion and help others. And he, he's, he's done that in his life, certainly. As it is. And um, 
uh, this is actually a way to heal ourselves, you know. We, we, if we are able to express love to others, it flows, it flows through it. It wakes up that feeling inside of us and we become a conduit for this wonderful experience of universal love. What will you learn about how love can transform your world in this class? You will develop a greater ability to love yourself. A lot of people have trouble with that. We'll learn how to cultivate compassion. We'll discover ways that we can express that compassion, that desire to help others. And <clears throat> we can we, we'll explore that together because everyone has ideas and everybody has experiences. There's a special way of realizing that that you deserve to be loved. You're already loved and you completely deserve to be loved. And you may have done things that you regret, but ultimately we are pre-forgiven. <laughs> In, 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 by, by the universe, you could say. And all of this will contribute to developing our own sense of higher purpose. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this a lot. I hope you can join us.